Good morning, everyone. And good morning to those of you who are joining us on the live stream as well. I'm Rabbi Sue Shankman. It gives me great pleasure and pride to welcome you to Washington Hebrew Congregation's Amram Scholar Series. The Amram Scholar Series offers a stimulating program of free lectures throughout the year in which world-renowned speakers, authors, scholars, political leaders, policy analysts, and theologians share their perspectives on timely issues or their research into history. The program traces its beginnings to the fall of 1954 when Washington Hebrew moved to our Macomb Street home. That fall, participating in a nationwide celebration marking the 300th anniversary of Jewish settlement in the United States, Washington Hebrew launched what would become this widely recognized Sunday morning lecture program. Today's Amram lecture is sponsored by the Hochberg family and the Abraham and Frieda Hochberg Creative Cultural Fund. And we want to thank their daughter, Marilyn Hammerman, who's sitting here in the front. Uh, she's present, and uh, also thank her brother, Phil Hochberg, and his wife, Jane, who I hope are watching from the live stream, for their ongoing support of the Amram Scholar Series. Uh, and I think people know Phil, we're also so proud of Phil, who is, uh, was the stadium announcer for the old Washington Senators, and a consultant on sports to the Smithsonian Associates, and as well as a longtime attorney in the sports field. Uh, Marilyn is here with us as well, and while not part of our community on a regular basis. We're always happy to have you with us uh, and representing your family in this way and are so appreciative and grateful for the Hochberg Fund. Our speaker this morning is Jeff Nussbaum. Jeff most recently served as a special assistant and senior speechwriter to President Joe Biden. In May 22, 2022, his book, Undelivered, The Never Heard Speeches That Would Have Rewritten History, hit shelves. Writing in the Washington Post, historian Douglas Brinkley called Undelivered a hell of a fun ride and described Nussbaum as having a witty Art Buckwald-esque writing style, which actually is similar to his speaking style as well. <laughs> Over the past quarter century, Jeff has helped clients pen and promote best-selling books, prepare commencement speeches and viral TED Talks, and deliver winning comedy routines at venues ranging from the Alfalfa Club to the Al Smith Dinner. From 2005 to 2020, he served at West Wing Writers, becoming a partner in 2007. As a founder of the Humor Cabinet, he has worked on humor speeches for dozens of elected officials and corporate executives. He has also served as a creative consultant for the Kennedy Center Mark Twain Prize for American Humor. Jeff has also played an integral role in the past six Democratic National Conventions. He helped direct the speech writing and messaging operations for the 2008, 2012, 2016, and 2020 conventions, and served as on-site writer, editor, and presentation coach in 2000 and 2004. From 2001 to 2004, Jeff served as Senate Democratic Leader Tom Daschle's Deputy Communications Director and Speechwriter, where he had his best boss ever in Ronit Schmelzer, uh, who is also a member here at Washington Hebrew. And I'm not just saying that because she's here. Right? <laughs> Prior to that, he served as a speechwriter for Vice President Al Gore in the White House and later as a senior speechwriter for Gore Lieberman 2000. Jeff was the co-author and collaborator with James Carville on the 2003 bestseller, Had Enough. Jeff also collaborated with former Senator Bob Graham on his book, Intelligence Matters. Jeff has appeared on the Today Show, PBS NewsHour, CNN, CNN as recently as this morning, and NPR Studio 1A. He has been profiled in Esquire and the Jewish Insider. He has also had commentary published under his own name in the Washington Post, Politico, The Atlantic, 538, The New York Daily News, The Daily Beast, McSweeney's, Washington Monthly, and many others. I think we actually need to have you do a column for the uh, Washington Hebrew Congregation Journal. Okay, add that to the list. Jeff is a graduate of Brown University. He lives in Chevy Chase with his daughters, Ada and Sophia. And I know that I speak on behalf of my Washington Hebrew clergy colleagues when I say that we are incredibly grateful and proud to have Jeff as part of our Washington Hebrew congregation family and community. And, uh, and we look to you often as a source of constructive feedback and great insights. Um, and though you have suggested that sermon writing is a slightly different art, 
my colleagues and I rely on your perspective for inspiration and will continue to do that as we continue to develop and hone our own voices of leadership. And as we will hear this morning, Undelivered is much more than the unearthing of words thought to be lost to history, but a guide to impactful communication. So following Jeff's presentation, we'll engage in some uh, Q&A, and that will be followed by an opportunity for folks to purchase a book and have Jeff sign it as well. So without further ado, Jeff Nussbaum. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I'll, I'll begin um, by saying that as Jews, we don't belong to a faith that leans heavily on confession as a regular practice. Um, that said, I do want to begin with a confession. For years in my private sector life, whenever a client would say they wanted to write a book, I'd say, absolutely, you must write a book. And then I would add, you know, in the Talmud, it's written that to live a full life, one must plant a tree, raise a child, and write a book. Right? Sounds kind of Talmudic, right? Um, turns out a member of the clergy here pointed out to me that that statement is nowhere to be found in the Talmud. <laughs> so my confession is that I encouraged a lot of clients to write books and profited greatly from it under false spiritual pretenses. <laughs> so it feels a lot better to get that off my chest. Um, so um, I'll pause here to thank you guys for being here this morning and, and thank the folks watching on the live stream. And the reason I did not thank you at the beginning as you will find on page 43 of the book, is that the most compelling presentations do not start with the acknowledgments. Audience, people, speakers have a limited time to capture audience's attention, so you want to jump right in. So now I will pause to say thank you um, to Marilyn and the Hochberg family for sponsoring this talk, and Rabbi Shankman for leading this conversation, and as you lead so many conversations, everyone involved with book sales outside, including Becca, um, Mohan and Binyam for getting everything set up. And then I do need some of you to think of questions um, because I'm only gonna talk for a little while and Rabbi Shankman I think will be happy to defer to you and every speechwriter's motto should not be leave them wanting less. So, um, so there's a joke in speechwriting circles about a speechwriter who dies and is offered the choice between heaven and hell. Now I took the 12 Jewish questions class and I know the Jewish conceptions of heaven and hell don't quite work for this joke, so you're just gonna have to bear with me for a minute. So the speechwriter dies, offered a choice between heaven and hell. Being a good researcher, as all speechwriters must be, he first says, a choice between heaven and hell, let me see hell. And there he sees millions of speechwriters hammering away on millions of keyboards on deadline. And he says, that certainly seems hellish, let me see heaven. And there he sees millions of speechwriters pounding away on millions of keyboards on deadline. And the writer says, but this is the same as hell. And St. Peter says, oh, no, no, up here we use their material. <laughs> so anyone who writes speeches for a living has speeches that went undelivered for one reason or another. President Biden was supposed to actually give a speech. He was walking to give a speech on electric buses that got scrapped when the George Floyd verdict came down. And, and I have to say, I wrote a damn good speech about electric buses. Um, <laughs> But I didn't write the book to, to salvage electric bus speeches from history's scrap heap. The obsession began on election night in 2000 when I was left holding three speeches that had been prepared for Al Gore, a victory, a concession, and then strangely enough, we thought that Al Gore would win the Electoral College and lose the popular vote. So there was a section in that speech explaining that Electoral College is still a win, something Americans have learned the hard way a couple times since. Um, and so following that, I, I thought, you know, and, and after that, I went to work with, with Renit, for Renit, with Tom Daschle. And in the space of a really short amount of time, um, and I'll try to keep Renit from curling into the fetal position as we remember this, like a 50-50 Senate, the Iraq War, September, I mean, September 11th, the Iraq War, anthrax attacks. I mean, just these amazing historical events all happened in incredibly rapid succession. And I kept thinking how different it all would have been, but for 500 votes in Florida. And so... So it got me thinking, it's not just about what happened, but, but sometimes what didn't. And so after 2000, I found and accumulated and reconstructed these dramatic moments of choosing and consequence and circumstance where one outcome was so possible that there was a draft prepared for that outcome. If we had launched 800 airstrikes as planned on Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis against what we only learned later were already armed nuclear missiles. If Emperor Hirohito had resigned the throne and thrown himself at the mercy of the war crimes tribunal at the end of World War II. If Kevin White, who was a progressive mayor of Boston in the 70s, had become a northern George Wallace and refused to desegregate Boston schools. 
if Al Shanker, uh, who some of you know was a, was a big deal in New York in the 70s, refuses to bail out New York and the city goes bankrupt. If John Lewis had said what he really wanted to say at the March on Washington, and all people heard from that march was the nightmare and not the dream. For those of you who watched The Crown, if King Edward had gone directly to the British people asking to marry Wallace Simpson and held onto the throne, leaving Britain with a Nazi sympathizing king at the dawn of World War II, if Nixon refuses to resign and fights impeachment to the end, if anarchist Emma Goldman uses her trial for inciting a riot to actually incite a riot, all of these things and a lot more could have happened. And not only could they have happened, but there were speeches prepared that would have set them in motion. And so I'm not a historian and I'm not a journalist, but this project allowed me to be both, and it was really fun excavating history. In each chapter, I recreate the events, sometimes less well-known, sometimes forgotten, and then share the speech. And then I offer a little bit about what it says about the process of speech writing. So the chapter that kind of got it started for me was New York's near bankruptcy in 1975. And I learned that it took place uh, against the backdrop of the Al Smith dinner, right? So this is a black tie, white tie dinner for New York society. And, and all of this was happening. New York was set to go bankrupt the next day. And so all of the power players were in the room at the Al Smith dinner. Most of them were drunk. And they were sort of being pulled into alcoves and, and trying to negotiate. And after the dinner, they retired to Dick Ravitch's apartment. And I was able to talk to Dick Ravitch. And, and he had no food. Um, so the only thing they can find is a box of matzah in his cabinets. <laughs> and, and this momentous negotiation takes place. And everyone leaves at about 4 in the morning. And, and Ravitch later said, like, did it happen? Did it not happen? The only evidence I had that something happened in my apartment was this trail of matzah crumbs. <laughs> Um, so I, I start the book with, with John Lewis, um, and this is a picture I found in the archives that I don't think had been published before, I th but it's in the book. So this is John Lewis with Cortland Cox and Jim Foreman, and that's Jim Foreman's wife, Mildred Foreman. Um, they've retreated to the back of the Washington Monument as the, as the speeches are already starting at the March on Washington, um, and they're furiously editing John Lewis's speech. And the reason they are doing that is because the night before, John Lewis didn't even want to speak at the March on Washington. He thought it was kind of corporatized and watered down, and he said, it's a march in Washington, it's not a march on Washington. And he had recently become the head of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and, and he said, look, if I'm going to speak, I'm going to put some sting into it, some sting into it. And he did. His first draft was... Uh, it's incredible, but it's, it's angry, it's militant. It says we can't support this, the, the administration's civil rights bill. It says they'll, they'll come a day after this march where we won't confine our marching to Washington. We're going to march through the South the way Sherman did and burn Jim Crow and segregation to the ground. And finally, he says, and to those who counsel patience, I want to be clear, patience is a dirty and nasty word. And now this set in motion this, this interesting series of events because other speakers were putting their speeches out the night before, and Cox and Foreman thought John Lewis should get some press, so they put his speech out. And the Archbishop of Washington, Archbishop O'Boyle, gets wind of this and basically says, I'm not going to deliver the invocation if you're going to say these types of things. And O'Boyle was kind of interesting, as dominoes keep falling, because Kennedy was looking for O'Boyle's blessing on the march to embrace it himself. And so you see how all these things start to become a big problem. And so, you know, Lewis agrees, I'll take out patience, fine. But then everything was open for debate. And so as the march is going on, a parade of people is trying to get him to tone down these remarks. And John, um, Martin Luther King comes up to him and says, John, you got to tone it down. This doesn't sound like you. And, and Lewis kind of fires back at him. Yeah, Martin, but it sounds like us. It sounds like the young people. And so finally, finally, A. Philip Randolph, the organizer of the whole thing, basically comes to Lewis with tears in his eyes and begs him, says, John, we've come this far together. Please let us stay together. And Lewis finally says, well, saying no to Randolph would be like saying no to Mother Teresa. And I decided to change the speech. And Lewis ultimately modifies the speech quite dramatically. And in the book, I have a before and after visual. Of, of how he changed it, even down to the single word changes. So he talks about the residents of Danville, Virginia, 
living in fear in a police state, which he changes to the residents of Danville, Virginia, living in fear of a police state, right? And those are two very different things. If you're living in a police state, that's a statement of lived circumstance. If you're living in fear of a police state, it's something that could happen. And so he gives himself some wiggle room. He says, we can't support the civil rights bill. And then he adds, in its current form. So he modifies it, he gives the speech. It is still received as kind of the fieriest speech of the day. Um, but he's a little frustrated with himself. And, and he kind of wishes he had gone a little harder. But, in, but in, in actuality, what happened is it provided this really beautiful point counterpoint where Lewis talks about the nightmare and then King gets up and talks about the dream. Um, and I have a lot more to say about this, but, but, I'll, but I'll move on to say one of the questions I've been asked several times is what's the speech of these that I wish had been given? Um, now, an easy answer for me and whoever shares my politics, and I'm guessing that most of the people in this room do share my politics, uh, is Hillary Clinton's 2016 victory speech, which she, which she gave me. And, um, and in fact, she gave it to me because I was telling her, she, I was helping her, I, I didn't do much for her campaign, but I was helping her with her Al Smith dinner speech. And she said, am I the first woman to speak at this dinner? And I immediately said, oh, no, no, that was Ella Grasso, the governor of Connecticut in 1975. And she looked at me and she's like, how do you know that? And I said, well, that night, New York was about to go bankrupt. And so, she, so as I told her about the book, she said, well, when this election's over, I should give you, um, I should give you whichever speech I don't give. Um, and so I waited a couple months after the election. And I said, so, so about that offer, um, and she remained incredibly generous. But her speech is interesting because you see all of the fissures that ran through the campaign, they run right into the victory speech. What are we going to say to the Bernie supporters? What are we going to say to the Trumpists who I've just called deplorable? What are we going to say to the elite media that expected a bigger victory? And so the speech itself is strong, but it's not really cohering. And she knew this too, and she was looking for a way to kind of, to kind of finish it. And she found it in the story of her mother. And one of the things that happens when you're working on a campaign and you're not doing as well as you think you should be doing, um, everyone becomes the speechwriter. I mean, you get hundreds of emails saying, like, if she would just say this, it would fix all her problems. And so the, the speechwriter, um, a guy named Dan Schwerin, who's a lovely guy, and this is them actually working on the election night speech. Um, he, gets a, he creates an email folder for all of these emails he's getting, and one comes in from a Pulitzer Prize winning poet named Jory Graham. And it's this imagined conversation Hillary has with her mother as her mother as a young child. And her mother's life story, um, she told a little bit during the campaign, but as an eight-year-old was abandoned by her parents sent to live with her grandparents who couldn't care for her either and basically became an indentured servant and was out on her own when she was very young. And so Jory Graham kind of has this imagined conversation where she, um, well here I'll read a bit of it for you. I, I just think it would have been such an incredibly powerful moment. <clears throat> This summer, a writer asked me if I could go back in time and tell anyone in history about this milestone, who would it be? And the answer is easy, my mother, Dorothy. By the way, I'll pause here to say that if you're audiobook people, we had actors read these speeches for the audiobook. Um, it just got nominated this week for an audio award. It's, it's really amazing to kind of hear these speeches come to life with actors. You may have heard me talk about her difficult childhood. She was abandoned by her parents when she was just eight years old. They put her on a train to California where she was mistreated by her grandparents and ended, out, ended up on her own working as a housemaid. Yet she still found a way to offer me the boundless love and support she never received herself. She taught me the words of our Methodist faith, do all the good you can for all the people you can, in all the ways you can for long as ever you can. I think about my mother every day. Sometimes I think about her on that train. I wish I could walk down the aisle and find the little wooden seats where she sat, holding tight to her even younger sister, alone, terrified. She doesn't yet know how much she will suffer. She doesn't know she will find the strength to escape that suffering. That's all a long way off. The whole future is still unknown as she stares out at the vast country moving past her. I dream of going up to her and sitting down next to her and taking her in my arms 
and saying, look at me, listen to me. You will survive. You'll have a good family of your own and three children. And as hard as it might be to imagine, your daughter will grow up to become the president of the United States. So, right, I mean, what a moment that would have been. And it's just a shame we didn't get to hear it. Um, so there are a couple others um, that I wish had been given. One is uh, John Peter Altgeld in 1897. Um, this is not someone I knew much about. He was the governor of Illinois. Josh Galper, you're, you're a Chicagoan. Did you learn about John Altgeld growing up? A little bit, right? He's a real hero. I mean, he's really an interesting character, progressive hero. He made, he made a lot of money in real, he was an immigrant. He made a lot of money in real estate, um, became good friends with, with people like Clarence Darrow, um, ran for governor, self-funded, wins. And one of the things he decides to do as governor <clears throat> is he's gonna pardon the surviving Haymarket prisoners. These are the people who had been imprisoned with, under a real sham trial for inciting the Haymarket riots. And he knows that this is gonna just unleash fury on him. And, um, and an interesting side note is, so he prepares the pardon with his Secretary of State and it has to get delivered to the prison where these guys are in prison. And the person who begs to deliver the pardon was one of the jurors on the jury who originally convicted him. So the juror was so heartsick, he basically said, let me please deliver the freedom to these men. So this unleashes a massive wave of anti-immigrant sentiment against the prisoners and against the governor. And he's basically drummed out of office. He loses re-election. Um, and to, to add insult to injury, he, um, he, and by the way, the, the press at the time, I mean, it was just brutal, right? They say he would have developed into an anarchist himself if he hadn't been lucky in real estate. His middle initial was P. They started calling him John Pardon, Altgeld. I mean, it was, it was really bad and it was really ugly. He gets drummed out of office and he's denied the opportunity to deliver a farewell address. And his farewell address was about the responsibilities of putting partisanship aside and governing. And so it was this really powerful message about the need for leaders to step up and lead. Um, I'll quote, in my judgment, no epitaph can be written upon the tomb of a public man that will so surely win the contempt of the ages than to say that he held office all his life and never did anything for humanity. So he had this beautiful, powerful warning about sort of partisanship run amok, and I wish we had heard it, could hear it today. Um, and then I mentioned, um, you know, I mentioned, and by the way, so this is some of what he, what happened. Uh, like this was like, there, there he is wearing the hat and he's, he's called the friend of mad dogs, right? Like, so this is kind of what he was facing. Um, <clears throat> but it reminded me of Kevin White in 1974, um, who, you know, has to enforce a judge's order that he thinks is really wrong headed. Um, but he basically, he had prepared a speech basically defying the judge's order, closing South Boston High School rather than integrate it. And, and ultimately, he decided to reverse course. And he said, look, we've just seen Nixon's resignation. We are a nation of laws. I don't, I don't think the judge is going about this the right way, but I'm going to follow the order. And, and then he says bravely um, in a quote that I love, there is no odor save death, worse than that of a public official, too frightened and fearful to say above a whisper, what he honestly believes. So those are, you know, the two speeches that I would love, would love to have been given. And then there's John F. Kennedy's speech that he was on his way to deliver in 1963 when he was assassinated. And to the extent that people know it, they know that he has this beautiful quote about we in this country, in this generation, are by destiny rather than choice the watchmen on the walls of world freedom. Um, and this is where he has the psalm, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. But a closer reading and a, and a look at the history reveals that it actually wasn't really a foreign policy speech. Like, yeah, Kennedy wanted America to serve as the watchman on the wall of world freedom, but he also wanted the watchman to be working, looking inward. Um, in fact, more than half the speech is devoted to what Ted Sorensen called, quote, the fires of rage that burned underneath the surface of America's peace and prosperity. And the fires of rage he was talking about were this increasingly vocal right-wing effort to discredit and demonize Kennedy. 
Um, one of the leaders of that effort was Edwin Walker, who was a former World War II general who helped foment the riots of the University of Mississippi when they attempted to integrate with James Meredith. Walker also ran as a fringe candidate for governor of Texas. And the language he used in that campaign is so remarkably similar to the language we heard and unfortunately continue to hear from President Trump, you know, pro-communist, pro-socialist, liberal run amok. And as we've seen all too often recently, violent words are a precursor and a permission structure for violent actions. So Kennedy was to say, you know, today there are other, I'm quoting, today other voices are heard in the land, voices preaching doctrines wholly unrelated to reality. And also ignorance and, and quote, ignorance and misinformation can handicap the progress of a city or company, but they can also handicap this country's security. And so his hope, and again I'm quoting, is we cannot expect that everyone will quote, talk sense to the American people, but we can hope that fewer people will listen to nonsense. <clears throat> you know, leaders play a role in increasing our awareness of threats and conditioning our responses to them. So it's an interesting question, right? Would Americans have sat up and paid attention if their president, who was 70% popular at the time, had hectored them to stop listening to nonsense? You know, if Kennedy had lived and secured a second term, would he have made combating domestic extremism a priority? You know, articulating the threat from within as clearly as he articulated the threat from Russia in his first campaign. We can't know, of course, but what we do know is that Kennedy wanted an America and was prepared to say it where fewer people listen to nonsense. And then Kennedy, he makes two appearances in the book. Um, uh, one that I'm very glad was not given. This was his airstrike speech, which I mentioned at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> and not on this page, but on one of the pages, you find he has a parenthetical where he says, you know, I've launched these airstrikes and, you know, the tragedy self-evidently is the loss of life on both sides. And then there's a parenthetical that says, follows a description of first reports of action. Right, and speechwriters do this a lot. You put in a parenthesis to say, all right, when we know what happened, we'll fill in what happened. Of course, as I said, later we only later realized that these, these nuclear missiles were not only armed and several cases operational, but command was in the hands of the battery commanders on the ground. They didn't even have to call back to Russia to launch them. So it, it, it's not only possible, but really likely that if this had been the course of action, the response would have been at the very least the vaporization of our basic Guantanamo in a lot of South Florida, and, and at the worst, uh, you know, a, a swath of destruction from Boston down through Omaha, Nebraska, and over to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so really, really heavy stuff. And in this, in the book, I go down a rabbit hole trying to figure out who wrote the airstrike speech because everyone later who was involved with it denied being involved with it. <laughs> um, and and I think. You know, President Carter's in the news and on our minds today, and he, Carter had this great line once when he said, you know, on your headstone it says the year you're born and the year you die, and then a little dash in between. And Carter said, to God, that tiny dash is everything. And I look at that speech and I think, to history, to humanity, that parenthetical could have been everything. So a while ago someone asked me what's the thesis of the book. And, and I picked up on the fact you can always tell who hasn't read the book because you get a very generic, I didn't read the book, book report type question. Um, <laughs> but, but in the case, it was a really good question. And I found it in the chapter I wrote about President Eisenhower, who had actually prepared a speech should the D-Day landing have failed. Um, in the speech, you can see he takes the line. He writes it very quickly. It's in his own hand. He misdates it in, in, his, in his speed. And he but he takes out the line, the troops have been withdrawn, and puts in the line, I have withdrawn the troops. Um, and then at the bottom, it's a little covered there, but if any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it's mine alone, and he underlines mine alone. And I love it, right, because he puts it in pa it takes it from passive voice and puts it in active voice. And, and of course, the language of leadership matters. And it reminded me of some, a quote I found from President Grant, which I use in that chapter, where Grant says, I am a verb. I'm a verb. Now, the context for Grant saying that was he was like complaining to his doctor. He's like, I hurt, I suffer, I bleed. Um, so he was just whining. But, you know, but, but I'm a verb. But the point being, leaders are action takers. Leaders don't hide. They take responsibility. They make things right. And, and because so many of you here and watching uh, occupy positions of leadership and influence, um, 
it's a reminder that outcomes often rest on a razor's edge, and we all have the power to nudge things. And that's really the thesis, to use the positions we have to make the difference we can, because that can make the difference for a congregation or a community or a country. And so with that, we'll have our conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, you're sitting right there. <laughs> um, I, I love that idea about the, you know, there's the passive versus the active voice, and it's something I, you know, and I'm, I do a lot of editing. I have three children, so I do a lot of editing applications over the years, essays, et cetera, and always, uh, I, I, I think there's a lot of um, passive voice taught in English classes, and, uh, and that idea of, of ownership. Um, which I love particularly in the, the airstrike speech in that chapter, you know, it really is mind-boggling how people go back and forth and remember part of it, remember the chain of events, but then nobody remembers the outcome, who actually, who actually authored. Um, and uh, and I, I know that there will be questions from, um, from those of you who are seated here. I'm sure some of you on the live stream have questions and will be happy to have follow-up with Jeff at some point. Um, but I'm, I'm curious in the process, and you said you're not a historian, you're not a, a journalist, but, um, but you did a lot of research, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering if there's anything that, uh, any, whether surprising speech or surprising information that, um, that you discovered in the process of writing this book. Um, yeah. The one speech that isn't in here, it's the only chapter I wrote. Here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the only speech that isn't in here that I still wrote the chapter is Condoleezza Rice was supposed to give a speech on September 11th, 2001. Like, literally, she was preparing to give a speech as the September 11th tax were happening. And, and so I was able to, through a Freedom of Information Act request, figure out what she was going to say. Like, I basically got all the material except the speech, and she was, it was a speech about missile defense. And I think one of the reasons it remains classified, not that I tried to score any political points in the book, but there were lines in the speech like, some people say greater security just means better metal detectors at the airports. So she was very derisive of the thing that was happening as it was happening. Um, but one of the things in that chapter, when you look at the material she had, she was about to write a speech in a practice called, there are lots of ways to write a speech, but she was gonna write a speech um, through a practice of refutation. She was gonna sort of line up all the arguments against missile defense and try to knock them down. And the fun discovery was that the, all the arguments they were gonna line up to try to knock down were coming from the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, who at the time was Joe Biden. So it was very funny as I was doing the research to like look at them, figure out like, how do, we, how do we maneuver around Biden? Um, so that, that was kind of a fun discovery um, among many. Were there, you guys hear me okay? In this this is a, we have to like eat this one. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm used to this one. Um, were there any speeches that you either didn't or couldn't include in, uh, in the book um, and any that you hesitated to include but did anyway? Not, not really. I mean, there were a lot of speeches I found. Um, and if you look at the book, they kind of arranged themselves neatly into categories, fog of war, path towards peace, things like that. Um, you know, there are a million commencement speeches that didn't get given because like a thunderstorm rolled in. You know, like I, I, Mark Twain, uh, Sam Clemens was, you know, supposed to like christen a steamship that like it failed to roll off the dry dock. And so, so he had, and he had to travel the next day. So like that, and, you know. So there are lots like that. I tried to get at ones. My my bar actually, people said like, why don't you have Nixon's moon landing failure speech? And my bar was, it needs to be a speech that the speaker actually engaged with and considered um, what that might mean. So there's this wonderful story that. Um, Harry Truman was presented with a speech basically saying that the United States would not pursue hydrogen bomb technology any further. 
and like literally the speech was on his desk and he he said, he, like, he didn't look at it, he didn't open it. He said, can the Russians do it? And they said, yeah, and he said, then we're doing it, and like, sort of swept the thing away. So like, that speech didn't rise to the level. Um, so there, there, are a lot, there are a lot like that. So my last question before we open it up for folks here, is there any speech that you wish you could have rewritten? Oh, that's a good question. Um, or that you would rewrite today? It not. <laughs> Not, re not really. I have to give it some thought. I, this is that's an insufficient answer, I realize. But like, you know, what what was said was said. You know, and and, and like, I, I don't think there were many speeches that were given that set us in a that where where the words alone could have altered the the following events. I think I don't know. I'll have to think about it. That's a good one. Be an interesting question as we're yeah. preparing our high holiday sermons yeah. for, for the fall. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to see if there are some questions from those of you who are seated here. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, we've got the book at all different pros uh, just this week, so we tried getting in as much as we could. Right. We've started reading, but we haven't finished the full disclosure. Uh, uh, so my question is: is that you know, given the duration of your career? How has the proliferation of social media and you know the volume and perhaps the intensity of the scrutiny <coughs> changed how you think about speech writing and how do you think it's changed the craft overall? Yeah, that's a great question. And and I've seen kind of the change on happen on two levels. One is how this how speeches are consumed, and one is what their content is. So starting with content, even early on when I was just entering politics a lot more time in the speech was spent on explanation and a lot less time on activation. In other words, let me explain this issue, let me explain the policy, let me explain what I'm trying to do. Oh, and by the way, if you agree with me, like support me or support this, right? So a lot of explanation, not a ton of activation. Now it feels like, and it, it is, much more time is spent on activation, right? It's like, I'm here because we're standing together, and you know, and the reason, and so it's just, you're, you're, uh, you, speeches are spending more time, more actively appealing to a narrower swath than spending more time explaining to a larger swath. So that's the content change. And then this is happening against the backdrop of cons a consumption change. You know, right, until not that long ago, speeches were consumed largely as a whole. Um, you know, I mean, it's not like pack a lunch and let's go watch the Lincoln-Douglas debates or sit around the kitchen table and listen to FDR. But even so, you know, people would watch several days of political conventions or they would hear the whole State of the Union. And then something I really saw begin to happen uh, on the Obama 2008 campaign, which was, I think, the first campaign where like YouTube was really, really a presence in our lives. And so the campaign would cut up the speech into like three or four minute blocks, which are still pretty long. And people would watch those and it would sort of vector in if they wanted to watch the whole thing. But then you have, and, but, but now you have, even when you write, like the exercise of writing the speech is a very useful exercise to get everyone on the same page and to tell the full, full story. But when I write, it's basically, okay, this is gonna be the tweet and this is gonna be the Instagram story and this paragraph is what's gonna go into the fundraising letter, you know, and this, and this, and this. And so you really do write with how it will be consumed in mind, and you recognize that it's, it's, it's rare that it will be consumed as a whole. So thinking back, um, perhaps back to the founding fathers until today, I imagine um, we didn't always have the luxury of speech writers, um, and those who did perhaps didn't use them as often as others. <clears throat> who do you think was the best speech writer that didn't rely on help from, from Oh, that's a that's a great question. Well, I, I well not to, not to argue the premise, but like Alexander Hamilton was George Washington's speechwriter. You know, like he was his aide de camp. So, um, but we throughout history, world history, there have been um, leaders who are amazing writers, right? Like you think of Václav Havel in Czechoslovakia, right? He was literally a poet, that was his job. And you know, Obama, you can see who he was and what he wrote in, in you know, Dreams from My Father long before he was in a position to have someone help him write. So 
to me, the whole, the whole job of the speechwriter is not to come in and treat some powerful person as an empty vessel that you're gonna fill up with words, right? It's not to write the platonic ideal of a speech. It's to help them be their best self. And the example I often use is, I think on paper, George W. Bush has some of the most beautiful speeches you will ever read. But when he's delivering them, it's like watching a guy walk across a tightrope, right? It's like, is he gonna get to the end of this sentence without falling on his face? And you're, you're almost relieved when, when he does. And it's because like the speeches were beautiful, but they weren't him. And so to me, it's less about who was a great writer and who wasn't, because a lot of our presidents have been wonderful writers. But it's about, is there an alchemy um, among the team that allows them to be their best self? <laughs> it's also for the live stream, they won't be able to hear. Uh, hi, this has been uh, really great. I appreciate it. But um, kind of a two part question. I heard around the State of the Union speech this year that there's some starting thinking starting that maybe we should not have a State of the Union <laughs> speech anymore. I wonder how you felt about that. And it kind of relates to the other thing that's been on my mind, which is that. So many of the speeches you talk about seem to have been paid attention to by people across the political spectrum. And I feel like these days that doesn't happen. Like I can't imagine a lot of conservatives watching Biden's State of the Union speech this year. So I just yeah. wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, well, for starters, the State of the Union um, uh, speech for most of our history wasn't a State of the Union speech. <laughs> You know, the, the only thing the Constitution says is the president should report from time to time on the State of the Union, and so delivered as a letter um, most frequently. Um, and there was some, even some consideration of returning to that, you know, when, when Bill Clinton in 98 was in the midst of, of his scandal. So, um, so I'm trying to remember exactly when it, when it kind of became a speech. And be, oh, it was, um, it was Gerald Ford, I think, who, or I'm sorry, he may not have given the first speech, but he was the first person to say the State of the Union is. Um, and, and in his first year, he basically said the State of the Union is in rough shape. And then his second year, he said it's improving. And the third year, he said it was strong, and it's been strong ever since. We're so lucky. Um, uh, and, um, but yeah, there was a wonderful, wonderful article um, by Josh Tierengel in Time Magazine where he kind of posits a new way of doing the State of the Union. And he basically says the January 6th committee showed that, that if you can bring other voices in and you can bring other media and go live to other places and bring video, um, you can present a more compelling story. And I tend to agree with that. And I, I will say, every year, <clears throat> at some point during the State of the Union process, someone says, let's shock everyone and have a 10 minute speech and have it just be about one thing. And everyone says, good idea, good idea, good idea. And then it never, ever ends up that way, right? Because every interest group is conditioned to think, am I going to hear a line about my thing? Uh, every activist group the same way. And so it's, it's a terrible speech, always. I mean, even when it's wonderful, it's terrible because it's a laundry list. And there are a lot of uh, forces at play that will prevent it from ever being anything other than a laundry list until someone breaks the mold and breaks the form. Um, and I think that'll happen at, at some point. Um, and to the second part of your question, I think I spoke to that a little bit earlier. It, it, is, it is true. You have, you have fewer people listening directly. Although I will say, so I'm teaching a class right now at the Biden Institute in Delaware, and I just asked the class, how did you, I mean, I, I told them to watch the State Union. I said, how did you watch it? And of the class of 16, one watched on cable or network news. YouTube Live, Twitter, C-SPAN Online. So, you know, so the metrics tell us fewer and fewer people are watching, and I think the metrics are a little off. Like, they're watching, but they're watching in ways most people aren't even considering. I'm curious. <clears throat> I'll speak loudly. Um, what is the most difficult speech either you have written or that you've worked on, and why? Um, <clears throat> thanks. I, you know, it's funny, I, I hesitate to talk uh, too many about, like, too much about speeches like I've done or I've worked on, because, you know, ultimately it doesn't belong to the speechwriter, it belongs to the speaker. Difficult happens in two different ways. Difficult sometimes is 
you don't fully believe, right? You're, you're, right? Like, speechwriters are kind of like lawyers where we say, like, you know, a, a good lawyer can argue both sides of the case. Well, it's like a good speechwriter can do that too, except you have a right to a lawyer. You don't have a right to a speechwriter. Um, and so there have been instances where, you know, I've struggled to write something that, that I just didn't believe um, as much. Um, and then there are ones that are difficult because they're just so difficult emotionally. And uh, I'll share this story because I've asked permission from the Biden family to share this story. But in 2008, I was hired to write for and travel with whoever Barack Obama picked to be his running mate. And so I was given three convention speeches to write. It was Evan Bayh, Tim Kaine, and Joe Biden. And so, um, you know, and so I... <laughs> And even though I'd worked in the Senate, I didn't know Joe Biden. And Renit can speak to this. He was kind of like a little bit of a world unto himself. Um, and so I was introduced to him, and he, he, uh, he crossed himself, or as his sister told me, he said, we Catholics call it blessing ourselves. So he blessed himself, looked skyward, and said, I've been in the Senate longer than you've been alive. What are you going to teach me? Um, <laughs> that was my introduction to Joe Biden. And so instead of working on that speech with me, he sat in the room, but he put me in the room with his son, Bo, and to work on Bo's speech introducing Joe. And Bo's speech is six minutes long, and you can find it on YouTube. And here I am with Bo talking about the death of his mother and his sister and the toll it took on his father and how it shaped. And so, you know, you're sitting there thinking, like, how, how is he going to get the words out? I can't even get the words down. How is he going to get the words out? And so it, it ended up that speech ended up being the moment where Joe Biden was like, okay, you know, you passed the test. Um, you, you can roll with me, which I then did for the next three straight months um, from, or two months from the convention through the election. Uh, but so yeah, two, two different types of difficult. The answer is yes, Renit was the best boss. Okay, okay. So I'll, I'll lighten the mood a little bit. You, yeah. um, you do a lot of humor writing, yeah, yeah. and I'm curious, what's your process for that? And does it change if you don't think the person giving the speech is funny? Yes, 100% <laughs> yes. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I've always, the humor I've always kind of considered an, an outlet for my political road rage. And I will, you know, Rabbi Shankman, you said you were gonna ask at some point like my Judaism, and my initial answer was, so my, my, Ju my Judaism, comes um, more from the borscht belt tradition than the spiritual tradition. So li 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 literally, my, my father's side of the family business was one of those hotels in the Catskills. So, um, so I really did like grow up you know, going to places where there were like tumblers walking around by the pool cracking jokes. Um, so may maybe it's you know, genetic memory or something. But, uh, but the, when someone is not funny, one of the things when politicians are trying to be funny is they often fail to realize you get credit for trying, for starters, right? So like even a cheesy, corny joke, the audience doesn't expect them to be funny, so they get credit for that. And they get credit for knowing what funny is. So like a politician can say, you know, as Stephen Colbert said last night, and repeat it and get a laugh. I will say that when you write jokes for politicians who aren't super funny, there are certain things you do. We call it, we call it um, Lenoizing the joke, which is not necessarily a compliment, but it means you basically write a joke that is delivery proof, right? And, and um, like it is set up punch and you can't screw it up. Um, but also, you know, you write in a way that explains the joke a little more. Like, you know, uh, Seth Meyers had a joke at one of the White House correspondence dinners where he said, like, I'm going to tell a lot of jokes, but don't worry, I cleared it with the guy in charge, Chinese President Hu Jintao, right? So, right, so like China, most comedians in a non-political environment would say like Hu Jintao, but like you almost had to explain the joke before you got to the punchline. So you do that a lot more for, for politicians as well. Um, so that's at least the approach. And then the material, like, you know, the madness of the world gives, gives, <laughs> gives, you a, gives, gives us more of it than we know what to do with. Like I, I think I'm reading, you know, you said Art Buckwald, I'm finally reading this biography of Art Buckwald. Um, and one of his most popular columns was he basically had like a humorists endorse Richard Nixon for three terms as president. You know, he was happy with the material he was getting. First off, congratulations on the Audi Award. Um, <laughs> Thank you.
Um, thank you. Thank you for uh, saying that. I know you are a relentless researcher, and you've spent decades researching these folks. Besides the speech from Condor Torres, is there one speech, and I know you mentioned this in your book, Yeah, so uh, thank you. By the way, this is a former student of mine. Is that right? That's right, right? Yeah. What year at AU? Uh, it was uh, 2014. Star student. Yeah. And, and it's really well taught. Uh, that... <laughs> Did you really? It's going to be I gave you an A minus? Oh my God. And, and then you immediately went on to become a speechwriter for the mayor of Chicago, the head of the AFL CIO, and now the administrator of NASA. Is that correct? So an A minus got you this incredible career. No. And I think you just got raised up to an A. Yeah, right. If I can get retroactively into the transcript, I'd be happy to. So, um, uh, so yeah, there are a couple. I mean, I still want that Condi Rice speech. I've told the Bush Library, I was like, the minute it comes off classification, I want the thing. Um, and then, as you mentioned in the acknowledgments, there was a President Carter speech prepared for the failure of the Camp David Accords. And I really, really wanted that. And I talked to the person who had written it, and they remembered it. And I mean, they remember it really being like laying the blame at the feet of the Israelis, and which kind of is interesting foreshadowing, because I think we would consider Carter, Carter one of our most pro-Palestinian national leaders. And so like, is that where it came from? And so I would have loved to have found that speech to kind of help understand the Carter evolution. and. Um, I talked to the person who wrote it, um, a guy named Bill Quant. He said, oh, I remember it. It was sitting on his desk, and we were, we were really worried it was all going to blow up. And then finally, the deal came together, and we like swept everything off the desk into a box. And like I went to the Carter Center. It's like, the box is there, and the speech isn't in it. And so hopefully, it'll reemerge at some point. For whom, for whom has it been most fun? Writing speeches. <clears throat> That's a good question. I mean, so I, it, I, I'm speaking largely about my, my um, political life, but in private sector, I had a company where we wrote for CEOs and actors and athletes and celebrities and, and um, foundation heads. Um, so who has been most fun? I, uh, one of the things that happens is when you're working with someone, they say, like, I want to give a speech that's going to go viral. Like, I want to give a speech that's going to, you know, change the world and people are going to cite it. And for a long time, anyone who did a commencement speech was like, I want it to be like the Steve Jobs commencement speech. Um, so I'm going to dodge your question, but I'm going to say that I had this incredible experience with the, I'm sure I'm violating client confidentiality, so don't share it outside this room. People watching, don't share it outside your rooms. But like, the founder of Chipotle, decided he wanted to give a speech on why there was like no ethical way to eat chicken. Now, chicken is like a pretty big part of Chipotle's success. And so like we wrote this crazy, incredible speech that was like my problem with chicken. And, but it was sort of, it, it, it became kind of a larger speech about embracing more humane, smarter, healthier food pathways and understanding the true costs of food and not wanting to waste meals. And, and he finally looked at it, and he was like, I, I, can't, I can't give it. Love it, can't give it. Um, so it's fun when you run into those people who really, um, for any sort of reason, um, aren't restrained. You know, and I, the example I use is like, um, it's fun to write a speech for Bill Gates about why his foundation is investing in inventing a better condom, right? Like, no politician is gonna give a speech about like the realities of why condoms don't get used. But Bill Gates, you know, to pardon my language, you, the, you know, has no fucks to give, right? Like, you know, he's just like, I have the money, I'm gonna support this, I'm gonna do it. And when someone has that attitude, it is incredibly liberating. And so that's the kind of stuff I love. Ah, who's the most fun? I mean, I, I, I loved working for Tom Daschle. I really did. Um, a good sport and kind and decent um, and I think underrated as a speaker, um, for sure. Uh, 
So, you know, he, he was fun. And then the humor stuff is kind of funny, too. Like, it puts them in a different mindset. So, like, the things former New Jersey Governor John Corzine was willing to say in a humor speech, um, that, that was surprising and funny as well. Yeah. Um, I, I did not. I did not. In fact, I spent a lot of time, like my dad was a, an endocrinologist and a basic scientist. I spent a lot of time like in his lab, like drawing blood from rats. So, um, uh, so I loved writing. And, and so I don't know that I knew this, but my mom at one point shared, me, shared with me a letter I had written home from camp. Um, I was probably like nine or 10, and I had done it in the form of a New Yorker magazine. Like I, there were like cartoons and a little talk of the town section at the front and like a longer feature story. So, I mean, I think, <laughs> I think at some point I knew I enjoyed writing, but, but I applied for the White House internship when I was a, uh, after my sophomore year in college. And I wanted to do two things in my application. One was like name drop, the only name I could name drop in my family. My great uncle was a guy named Fred Kahn who had been involved with deregulating the airlines and was close to Carter. Um, and I wanted to get the attention, right? And my grades weren't gonna do that. So my essay for the application, I said, um, I told the story of my middle sister, um, who later went on to reality show fame. Uh, when she was one and I was five, we got to go into the Oval Office and meet President Carter. When it was time to leave, my mom picks up my sister and she has wet the rug in the Oval Office. <laughs> and so my application essay for the White House internship said, very few people are lucky enough to get a chance to make a mark in the White House. <laughs> I just want a chance to scrub out the one my sister already made. Um, and they kind of said, like, all right, throw them in with the speechwriters. So you, you touched on this. We, we talked about, we talked about a little bit about uh, how your Judaism yeah. connects with what you do. And uh, I'm wondering if you'll share how that has impacted the work you do, perhaps how you do it. You talked, I know, already about the, the Borscht Belt. Right, That's right. An important piece of that. and. Uh, maybe tying into that, you've not yet necessarily had a chance to work with perhaps some of the funniest people you might, or the most fun people to work with, as Steve asked, our, our clergy here at Washington Hebrew. Right. And what advice would you give us, uh, not just week to week, but for the high holidays? Oh, that's, um, sure. Well, first of all, by the way, the, the I will also give one quote on that answer. Is I, I forgot, I put a slide of the first speech I wrote for Al Gore, and it was captured on camera. So there is a much younger me with a lot more hair, um, handing Al Gore a, a, a vial of water that had been taken from a malfunctioning rural drinking water filtration system. Um, and there's a story behind that. But anyway, so that was, that was early on. Um, uh, so Judaism. Now, w what's, what's interesting is so um, when I was working for Al Gore, his speech training team was entirely Jewish, but he um, but somehow I became the guy writing like the, the Jewish audience speeches. And so I had my like Jewish audience speech jokes, like the joke about the yeshiva crew team, you know, punchline, right? Like they learned the problem was that they had, you know, eight guys yelling and only one guy rowing, right? So like, you know, I, so. I, I appreciate I, that as a former coxswain. Yeah, right, there you go. I can give you the whole joke. It works great for sermons too. Um, but, but in, but in reality, the it, I, I go back to like John Lewis, when you pray, move your feet. And I know that Tikkun Olam has become, unfortunately, almost a cliche. Um, but to me, working for social justice, working for people who I identified as advancing social justice, to me always felt like faith in action. And one of the tough things when you leave the public sector for the private sector, I think about a lot, is for a long time, all you needed to tell the world who you are and what you believed was your business card, right? Like when I was 21, I was working for Al Gore and it said like, you know, speechwriter Al Gore. And that was like, to me, that was like a good proxy for everything I believed, right? I believe we need to fight climate change. You know, I believe we need, you know, more progressive governance. And so for me, one of the challenges when I've left politics is, okay, how am I gonna find that sense of meaning um, that infused the work? Because 
because there are times when the work in politics is almost spiritual. Um, you are brought into communities at their lowest moments in many cases after tragedy and, and, um, and even when I'm working with clients and I'm getting them to tell me you know, why they believe what they believe or why they do what they do, it, it almost feels like therapeutic or pastoral. Um, and, and then finally I'll say that the, um, one of the reasons I think religious schooling is important is because it provides both a moral education but it's, it's amazing to look through speeches at how much um, the language of the Bible and the language of the Old Testament and the stories of the Old Testament still inform so much of our discourse today. There are very, very few moments, very, very few things now in the world that provide a common language that we all speak from, and, and the Bible's one of those things. Um, so for all those reasons, it, 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 feels, it, it feels connected to me. Uh, and you asked about you asked about sermon strategies. Yeah, I, 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 I we'll, we'll have to discuss offline. I, I I'll have to give it some I'll have to give it some thought. We, we've we've had this conversation before, and right. we'll, we'll continue it. Right. Um, I actually, what's it's fascinating that we're having this conversation this morning. Our tenth graders, our confirmation class, is currently on a weekend with the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism, a Litaken seminar where. They're learning about issues. They're learning why these issues are important in America today. They're learning about Jewish perspectives uh, on, uh, that, that inform how we react and, uh, and that guide us on, on what to do. And they are, this afternoon and this evening, actually, they'll be preparing speeches to go up to the Hill to meet with staffers from various, uh, from our congressional and, and Senate offices. Um, and actually, Brian's daughter is there, Lydia's there. I don't, know, I don't think anyone else who's in the room right now. Um, and they're going, to, uh, they're going to deliver these to our, uh, to our elected officials. And you know, most of theirs for our elected officials are going to be thanking them for their continued support on, on what these particular issues are. But they're there with kids who are coming from around the country. Um, and, uh, and hoping and, and learning that their voice can make a difference. And that this first little taste of it, that might be a nice follow-up at some point for you to sit with our confirmants, have them deliver those, yeah. share those, and, and, uh, and think about how do, they, how do they continue to hone their voice. Um, you know, we tell them that they're leaders, that, they are, that, their, voice, that their voices can uh, change the world. And I, I know that you know, certainly Brian's daughter Lydia is on her school Speech. She's not in the debate. She's in the speech and debate, speech speech. And debate uh, at Whitman High School, um, and and you know, for them to have role models who are doing this work and, and making that difference is really wonderful. So it's a, a nice tie-in uh, that that it happens to be this very weekend, so, and inspiring. And and who knows? Maybe some you know, uh, at, a, at an age where she's already thinking about uh, how she uses her voice and knowing that within our congregation and our community, she's got wonderful role models. Um, so thank you, Jeff, for your, your time today. Uh, and we, feel free, I know there's some people already clapping. <laughs> um, we're, we're so grateful, we know, we know how busy you are. Uh, we um, appreciate that, I don't know which is the, if you're moving up from CNN to Washington Hebrew. <laughs> but we like the order in which this happened today. <laughs> so you were all warmed up when you, when you got here. Uh, but also really for the ongoing voice that you, that you raise, um, not just for others, but, uh, but your voice as well, which I know is, is treasured in our community. And we appreciate um, having your voice raised and, uh, and continuing conversations on all kinds of topics. Um, but look forward to potentially continuing with, uh, with Undelivered uh, and thinking about, maybe we'll go back to some of our old sermons and, uh, and see what we can. I, I, will, I will share Rabbi Haberman of blessed memory. Um, in one of my early years here, and some of you know I've been here for 22 years, and I, I want to say it was maybe the second time I preached in um, the sanctuary at the High Holidays. They didn't let us preach in the sanctuary the first year we were here, maybe the second, it was con concerned we'd be overwhelmed, it's a lot of people doing it twice, etc. But he came back to me, I always sort of <laughs> um, anticipated, feared this moment when Rabbi Haberman would come back after the service to give 
his, his constructive criticism, his reaction to our sermons. And for those of you who knew him, um, that really came with a, carried a lot of weight. And one year he came back to me and he said, you should really give that sermon again. <laughs> and I said, well, how can I do that? I'll have to go someplace else to be able to give a sermon again. I, he said, no, you know, there are ways that you come back to. It's, it's said, and I've heard this recently too, that, that every rabbi or every speech giver has, and, and you talked about this in the book, there, there are you know, one or two speeches. Um, yeah. There are those continued topics. And uh, mm. I'm just curious if that's something you can go back to again and deliver in a way that is fresh and new. Uh, and I would look forward to, to hearing about that and potentially working on that as well. <laughs> of course, of course, and thanks. And, and the professional political communicators in the room know that it's not cheating to deliver the same thing again. It's just on message. Um, so, <laughs> so there's that. And, and I will say in the chapter, you'll, you'll see um, Martin Luther King gave the I Have a Dream speech hundreds of times. And sometimes it's the thousandth time you say the exact same thing that people finally listen. So anyway, thank, thank you, you all. Thank yeah. you so much.